Yeah, right here, you know? This is where all the stuff was. You know what I'm saying? It says, what happened to him? Like, he got, yo, they shot him. Shit, they shot him. On September 8th, 2008, Stephen Barton, a.k.a. Frost, an 18-year-old youth from Gabion Way, was shot dead while standing at a bus stop only minutes from his home. Have they ever ca caught the people who shot him? Yeah, it's them. Well, to be real, they have someone, but we don't know if it's him or not. You know what I'm saying? I don't, like, I don't care, but if I see the person who did this or whatever the case might be, I'm not even gonna say nothing. It's just the fact that something needs to happen, you know what I'm saying? This can't be happening. In the Gabion Way area of Mount Dennis, 15% of the population is between the ages of 15 and 24. Nearly half of these youths live in poverty. Police report this to be the most criminally active age group. When he died, a lot of people are talking negative stuff about him. And that's not true. Whatever you heard, it's not true. Not no, what was he? What was he like? What was he like? <laughs> he was something that you wouldn't even imagine. Someone different, different. Not like these other people out here. He had potential. He was smart, and you know, half of the stuff that they said that he did, or whatever, he didn't have to do that. You know what I'm saying? He could have made it out of here. Gabion Way, also known as G-Way, is a street located in the Mount Dennis area. It's a classic example of Toronto's diversity, with dozens of ethnic groups represented, including a large Caribbean and West African population. 33 Gabion Way is where our story begins. Cause let me tell you what, cause I'm one of the, the first people to move up in this building scene, and they didn't really want no, no colored people or no Chinese people mm, up in true. the place, it was just only a Portuguese building. That's all that was supposed to be in there. But then I guess they did like a, like sign some papers or something and did something where, I don't know how it went down. Yeah, the management got switched over to the government and you know the government is open, they're not all about one race. But now then they lost the management of the building, went over to the government, so the government opened the building to everybody. You can even get housing in this building. Chiway is lined with government-subsidized housing and apartments, mainly for recent immigrants and low-income families. Your square and Gabion Way is connected, period, because everybody lives in that building and that building are family. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You don't know it. <laughs> is this one of your family? It's, it's my family right here. You it. <laughs> it's my family, you know? It's one of my bridges, you know what I'm saying? Everything good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. So I see you getting tips over there. It used to be a close community, but now there's new people, new faces, and like people are growing up and all that. So people it's not. Yeah, people passed away. Rest in peace for my people who's not here right now. Dips, Amon, Frost. Especially my family, Dips. Don't know. Who, who's that? It's, it's a bitch. And the man's them off the block. You know, they pass. Toronto, 2005. The year of the gun. G-Way is hit hard by a barrage of bullets. First was Jamal Hemmings, a.k.a. Dibs, a 17-year-old youth from Gabion Way with a two-month-old baby. On November 10th, 2005, Dibs was gunned down in a parking lot. A mere eight days later, Amon Beckles, also of G-Way, was attending his best friend Dibs' funeral and was shot multiple times. Amon, 18 years of age, a father of a 16-month-old child, would die en route to the hospital. To this day, no one has been arrested for the murder of these youths. I'm saying to say RP to the niggas, you know what I'm saying? Say RP to the men though. My niggas is done, no? Say RP to all the men, you know what I'm saying, that dropped off. Let's see. Um, there's a lot of violence happening in, these, in this community. There's areas um, where youth are looking at, at places where their best friends have been, have been killed. This is a reality in this community, and we're, we're trying to combat that and let them know that there still is hope. 
JVS Toronto, a non-profit organization, works in low-income communities providing programs for at-risk youth to help them succeed in their school and work life. Orville Wallace is one of the 200 professionals at JVS who's committed to making a difference in the inner city. That nigga fast, you know what I mean? My nigga drop out. He's Dunno. still here up to this day, you know what I mean? He with me to the day, you know what I mean? Of course. All of them. All my niggas. You know the person who shot him, have they actually arrested anyone? Or have they never actually arrested someone? Was he there by himself at the time? You know, I really don't want to get too down into that because I don't want no police come asking me questions and come questioning me. I'm all gone. Don't want to talk about it anymore. I uh, want to change the subject. So, what'd you get in, what did you get in trouble for recently? Ah, uh, you want to know? I was in jail and I got released on house arrest. Uh, I was charged with under theft. Three fields complied. I got three threatening body harms. Um, extortion. I think lying, lying to the police. Like a lip gloss, uh, what else? Oh. Chocolate milk, like yeah, it was under $20. Have you been arrested yourself before? Things happen. Tried to label me as a menace to society. I don't know how. Couple of saws. Oh, mischief. Oh yeah, I forgot I had a mischief charge. A couple of uh, death unders, I said. Do you think that the police officers are doing a good job? No. My parents are pissed. Really? Yeah. Like for when I had to get out, my aunt had to pay. Just for him to show up at court that day, she had to pay a thousand dollars. And who bailed you out? Who bailed me? Ah, uh, kind of rough right now to say, cause you know. But my family did. Put it that way. My family did. I'm not gonna say exactly who. But if you watch this, you know exactly who you are. <laughs> Put it that way. And yeah, that's what it is. Of the seven youths interviewed in our group, five of them either had outstanding criminal charges or convictions. When asked why all the problems were happening, they had one resounding answer. Okay, it's because of money. 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 is the root of all evil. Or money. Stuff happens, you know what I'm saying? Got a little altercation. Yeah. Extorted someone, you know what I'm saying? It's hard, you know, when you're young, black male, can't get a job. There's a lot of people, like, if you have a charge, it's hard for you to get a job because you have a charge, so they don't want to trust you. So what else are you supposed and to do other than them. sell drugs or rob banks? What are you going to do? Sit down every day and not have a job and depend on your Everybody parents? Your yeah, basically, I knew someone, and I told him every time he gets paid, you know, send the money, you know? And that's why I got charged for extortion. That's what basically extortion is, you know? Telling the person that... I want half of everything you get, or whole, all of it. And I got kind of greedy, and I said I want all of it. So that's why, you know, I got charged, and the guy couldn't take it no more, put it that way. Why, why did you think that you should be able to ask this guy for his money? Oh, no, no, no. No, I was be, no, I was, well, not that I think I was able to, it's I could, and I did it. And that's why. It's life, it's life, it's life, it's life. If there was a leniency on, like, jobs where they give people second chances at work, I think there'd be less crimes in the city because then there'd be people, less people selling drugs because then they'd be at work. Like, I'm gonna look for a job that's gonna pay me well, but it depends on what, what you're doing, but what I'm looking for is something that's gonna pay me enough. Nice. I want millions. Nice. I don't want little money, I want millions, so I'm gonna make the best out of it. Um, kids nowadays are seeing things on TV where they wanna, they, they wanna get the best car, they want to get the best um, girl or, or, or they want to, for the girls they want to get the, the best looking guy and these are things that are pressuring our peers and forcing them, giving them images in their heads that are realistic and we need to look at our, at our core values and 
um, looking at why, why we're here today and what, what, what can we do in our lives to make it a better place. The youth from G-Way face additional challenges to the normal teen pressures of school, love, sex, or drugs. Economics is the driving force behind many of their decisions, and quick money can be a primary motivator. Valentine's Day? <laughs> my Valentine was garbage because I had training in the morning, and then after I went to my boyfriend's house, and he was supposed to take me out to, day, um, to dinner, he took me out to Asian Buffet, okay? And he didn't want to pay. He's like, Kamisha, let's leave, let's leave, let's leave. <laughs> and he's sitting there and he's going with all his ghetto. He's, he's sitting there and he's yamming off the food, like embarrassing me, everything. I'm just putting my head down. Things happen. Things, um, bills get caught up, you know what I'm saying? It might be one day you have to pay this bill instead of one bill. You know what I'm saying? You have to go without the water. You have to go without whatever the case might be. Utilities, basically, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everyone's just out here playing ball. Like that net over there is broken, but everyone's trying to put you in like five dollars for to get a new one from Canadian Tire. How many bucks are you at right now? No, we haven't started yet. So you're not making a lot of progress then with the mm. uh, the basketball net. Nah. Many of the youth in in these areas, uh, or in uh, many of the areas across Toronto, are coming from broken families. It's the breakdown of the nuclear family. Um, there's. Uh, there's less time spent at home with their parents. Their parents, it's usually a single parent, and for most part, it's, it's a mom that's working maybe two, three, sometimes three jobs, and there's not that much time being spent with the, with the child. So the child has now to be, is forced to be responsible on his own. So we're, we're living in times where kids are demanding more, yet they have to learn how to be more responsible and develop respect for others at a younger age. I've been working with the youth in Gabian Way for three years with my film partner and brother Yale. After reading about the problems in the neighborhood, we wanted to empower the youth with their knowledge of filmmaking so that they could make films as an outlet. It wasn't easy. It took time to break in and earn their trust. We didn't realize we'd also have to be social workers. How much longer do you have to go in school? The end of the semester. You're finished this semester. And what are you gonna do? Take care of his baby. <laughs> she has his kid. That's his baby mom. That's his baby mom. Yo, so I'm a kid, eh? Trust me. But what do you mean he's like a kid? You better think. Yo, know, this guy goes. He thinks it's not him. Let's go to Murray. Come on, baby. It is. Yeah. Oh, Jimmy didn't break. Oh, where's your baby now? So In her body. With my mother. And what's your baby's name? Tayshana. Abel Jr. Okay, so. Tell me something, man. If you if you are uh, if you are considered the father, will that change your mind on how you? Maybe. Yes. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. It it, it will change your attitude about it. Yeah. How so? How will it change? It will change because it's my kid. Lola Razminski, executive director of Arts for Children, sends artists like myself into high-priority neighborhoods to engage youth in relevant arts activities. For many of the artists that we engage, it's very exciting to be able to do this because they know that they're making more of a difference to these kids than to any other kids they might be working with. You know, to me, if, if, if we want to call the kids from these neighborhoods at risk, they're at risk of not realizing their potential and not engaging in constructive activities because often they're not just not provided. And so if they don't have something to do that interests them and that they can be excited about, you know, they're at risk of finding, finding other stuff that's not so, not so constructive. For a second, that's not a bad idea actually. We had worked hard at recruiting youth to participate in our short film program. At first, between 10 and 20 youth would attend on any given week. Scripts would have to be changed and our films would be improvised based on who showed up. Hold! 
Gotta tell the whole story. And the fact that the Massey bros were coming consistently week in, week out, gave a film presence at G Way. Okay. Okay. All right. Yo, yo. Sitting, 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 sitting in the in the sitting, 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 sitting in the yeah. Sitting, 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 sitting in the yeah. Sitting. Let's go. Sit. Yo. Sitting, sitting in the hallway, dropping beat. Rattles coming on when he's dropping the beat. I got lots with it. Somehow we miraculously produced four short films that were youth-driven, with one playing at a prestigious film festival in Toronto, which garnered local attention. Why is my drawers here? Why are you asking why they're your drawers? Why do they smell? <laughs> you don't why do they smell? Yo. Wash it. Are you mad, yo? You guys, you guys like my decorations? Oh, you did this? Beautiful. Yeah. I was beautiful like you, you know? You inspired me. Thank you, Marcus. But as time went on, the youth began to see past the glamour of movie stars and realize that making films was hard work. Attendance for our weekly film program had dropped. For many of them, time was money, and they were finding other things to keep them busy. Yeah, I can't lie. On the side, I deal, I deal some dope, you know what I'm saying? But that's what I gotta do. I need to make my money, you know what I'm saying? I gotta live my life. I don't have no one there for me. No one's there for me. Uh, my friend went to the store, me and my friend. And after he stole some shit, but I didn't know he was gonna steal. So after he stole it, he got caught. And then they charged me as an accessory to the crime. But I went to Scarborough Town Center to the rec center to get something. And I was on my way home and then after they called, like my house was calling me. They kept on calling so I thought something happened. I answered and they said, oh the police is here, they're looking for you, blah, 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 blah. And after the officer came on the phone, he's just talking a bunch of shit. You know how they are already. Oh, if you don't get here right now, we're gonna arrest you, blah, blah, blah. You're gonna be in jail for a long time. And I just got mad. I'm like, I don't wanna go back to jail. I blacked out and I punched the window at that Scarborough Town Center, and then it cut my hand. I almost died, basically, because I cut six tendons, an artery, and my ulnar nerve. So yeah, I almost died from loss of blood. It's crazy. I went to shock and everything. No one wants to hire me. I'm not getting no jobs, I'm not getting no phone. The only phone calls I'm getting is a, a fiend calling me for something. But I don't get no phone calls saying someone wants to hire me or anything like that, nothing like that. The youth had spoken about their needs, 